We're going to get stuck into our first round table. The question is specifically on the energy sector and how developing science-based regulation is moving forward. Um, what I'd like to say is we're going to listen to a keynote speech, first of all, from Teresa Ribera. She is uh, the... Um, she is the Vice President of the Government of Spain. She's also the Minister of Ecological uh, Transition. She'll be sharing with us some of the obstacles that Spain is facing when it comes to climate change, and also how the country is approaching carbon neutrality, a goal that they're hoping to meet by 2050. Let's have a listen to Teresa Ribiera. Bonjour, c'est un grand honneur d'être invité à participer à cette conférence si important. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this very important conference in this very important and tricky point in time. We are discussing about energy, about climate, about the prosperity, safety and equity in the humankind. How we can ensure that we all have access to modern sources of energy in a way that do not deplete the resources of the planet. This is a very important moment for everybody, but in particular for Europe. We are thinking how we can change our energy system, how we can draw lessons from, with who, what, from what we have been learning all along decades, and very much in particular during the last year, with the invasion of Ukraine and the impacts in the energy security and the economy. In a context where we have to respond to the main question mark, where are we? concerning the uh, fulfillment of the Paris Agreement targets dealing with climate. The response is not very good. We have much to do. And this is very precisely what we want to push forward during the presidency of the Council of the European Union by Spain. We think that uh, we have learned a lot. We think that there are many things that we can apply from the time being. And we know that the Fit for 55 package needs to arrive to the final uh, solution, to the final deal, so to ensure that we, working together, are able to respond to the climate and energy crisis. This is a very important point that I would like to underline. I am convinced that it is much better to do it together, to build on our common infrastructures, on our complementarities, to build much more Europe according to the main drives, the main lines in the energy and climate policies a real energy and climate European policy. The energy transition is not anything new. We knew that we had to push for a very deep transformation of our energy systems, but now it becomes absolutely urgent to do so. The fact that Russia invaded Ukraine did create this tension alongside the elements, the question marks on how we could ensure the supply of our needs, taking into consideration the high dependence from abroad. This is very interesting because, in fact, we count on the local capacities, on the local resources and the local innovation improvements that could provide a large share of the response that we need in terms of energy. So we know that we need to diversify our suppliers. We need to invest in much more renewable energy solutions to combine local and global needs in a way that provides profits for the local communities taking into consideration the need to ensure to save our uh, natural resources, our ecosystems, but also the local communities, the local societies, to invest in further innovation, in further performance of the renewable energy solutions. We need to strengthen our complementarities to be sure that we can connect our infrastructures. We need uh, to provide solutions that uh, could be applied whenever any disruptive event comes back again in our system so that we have the flexibility to count on different sources so that we count on the flexibility on count on different solutions. At the same time, we are convinced that the energy savings, the energy efficiency, being intelligent, being smart when using energy is the very first recommendation for anyone in the European continent and elsewhere in the world. This is something that challenges the public opinion. What does this mean, this very intense and sophisticated change in such a short period of time? And this is normal and we need to bear that. We need to understand that we need to provide a platform to shape consensus, to reach agreement among the local communities, among the investors, among the public institutions being in charge of promoting this energy transition. 
This is not an easy task, taking into consideration knowledge, social concerns, but also environmental and energy needs. This is why being sure that people can take place in this participative process and being aware of the need uh, to get the local communities the benefits that uh, the new investments may provide in the neighbourhood is very important. What uh, have we done in Spain? We worked since the very first moment so to ensure that we could work on an energy and climate framework that could provide the basis for this decision, for this discussion, for this um, understanding on how to perform in the time to come. There were technological goals, but there were also reflections on how we could combine the different capacities in the different regions. And this was open to the public contestation, to the public discussion. And this was the basis for what we did since the very first moment. And there are many things to be combined. Some of them need um, an agreement at the European level, because we know that the needs have changed. We need to invest in renewable energy solutions in the very proof uh, grid systems that ensure that we can transport electricity uh, whenever, wherever and in a very secure manner. We need to ensure that we can count on storage solutions and the storage business case needs to be built around the regulation. We know that digitalization of the grid and security could be very important. We know that now it is not anymore five, six, seven, ten, one hundred plants. It is many thousands of small producers of energy that do count in the system and the grid needs to provide a safe system so to ensure that going back and forwards do work in the electricity system. We need to electrify final uses to the extent possible. We need to work together at the European level so that we can keep on the investment so to develop new solutions to get rid of gas to the extent possible and as soon as possible whenever we use green hydrogen, to get used to facilitate access to other sources of renewable gases so to ensure that we can get into these circular economy solutions but also to facilitate the phase out of natural gas. To ensure that mobility is electrified as soon as possible in a way that it is affordable for the consumers, to be sure that consumers, citizens, should be at the core of our decisions, so that the just transition takes place not only for workers, but also for consumers. They can access to the benefits of this transformation as soon as possible. The risk in the investment decisions, ensuring a stable, stable, sorry, stable and predictable marketplace, facilitating the technology investments, ensuring that the academia do work not only at the technical level, but also in social science, so to facilitate this transformation that to a certain extent is a very relevant, important cultural mindset change. Doing this together is the best way to get a success. Doing this in a fragmented manner is a certain risk to get a success. What well, you heard from T Teresa Ribeira there, doing this together is the way uh, that key to success. Uh, so says uh, Teresa, very big uh, thank you to her. She is, is uh, the uh, Minister of Ecological Transition for Spain. Uh, let's get stuck in then to our first round table. Now, the key uh, message of this first round table is how to uh, develop science and new energy uh, regulation. Uh, I'd like to welcome on stage Valerie masson delmont She's co-chair of Working Group 1 of the IPCC and a climate scientist at uh, Paris Saclay. Uh, so up you come for us, uh, Valerie, if you would. Um, we equally have... We we can, we can applaud, absolutely. Welcome, Valerie. We have uh, Philip Drobinski, who is a director of the Energy for Climate Centre. Uh, welcome to you, Philippe. Laurence Taviana, CEO of the European Climate Foundation. Welcome to you, Laurence. And Estelle Braklianoff, Chief, Chief Executive Officer of Viola. Welcome to you. Just a quick reminder before we do this, there is a way to ask questions at this conference. The way is, as I said before, scanning that QR code and then filtering your questions and our IP Paris students will come up later uh, to get those questions out. So there is a way of doing this uh, for our debate. 
All right, I'd like to start then with uh, Valerie, if I may, Valerie. You're a senior scientist, okay, a, a climate scientist. Um, in your field, it would be good to get a sense of how, uh, how successful informing policies and regulations are in terms of mitigating uh, climate change. So it's quite timely today because yesterday with a group of 50 scientists, we released an update of key indicators of the state of global climate, updating the results transparently grounded in the same methods and data sets as in the 2021 IPCC climate report, which is a, a, a reference uh, for the, the, the state of knowledge. And we show that global greenhouse gas emissions up to 2022 have continued to increase, but with a stagnation of the CO2 emissions from the fossil fuel sector. So um, what is really critical is that the effect on climate for CO2 is associated with the sum, the cumulative CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. So if emissions stay at the same level, the climate effect continues to increase. And as a result from these increased emissions, what we see is an increase in, in global warming, now reaching 1.15 degrees Celsius. And we have also updated the estimate of the remaining carbon budget. So the margin, the window of opportunity we still have to limit warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And in 2021, we estimated that remaining carbon budget to be 500 billion tons of CO2 um, and revised now due to more warming, due to human influence, due to more emissions and a better way of accounting for non-CO2 effects. Uh, this uh, remaining carbon budget has been divided by two. Only 250 billion tons of CO2, which is about six years at today's rates of emissions. So what can I say about being su successful? <laughs> Um, what we see is, uh, from in particular the 2023 IPCC synthesis report, is that, of course, climate action is progressing, but clearly not at the pace, not at the scale required for governments to just be consistent with their own goals, um, limiting warming well below 2 degrees and close to 1.5 degrees. I, I want to get a sense from you, Valerie. How alarmed, you've given us a lot of interesting data there. How alarmed should we be by what you're seeing as a, a climate scientist? I, incredibly worried? I think uh, there are three main words I like to use related to the IPCC synthesis report, beyond the numbers I just provided. Mm -hmm. um, what is really striking is um, the widespread impacts of a changing climate in every region, the committed implications on the very long term, including sea level rise, due to already past emissions. And so the, the two words that first come to mind are um, the seriousness of the situation, mm -hmm. including you know, facing limits to adaptation and losses and damages. And the second one is the urgency of changing pace and scale of climate action, not small steps but really engaging into transformations to include resilience to a changing climate, including for the energy system, and reducing emissions at a faster pace. And if we just look at France, the challenge for France, which is one of the 18 countries which has demonstrated the ability to reduce emissions for decades, including the accounting for trade and imports, the challenge for France is doubling the rate of mm. annual emission reductions in the coming years. So this gives just a sense of urgency. And the third aspect is through advances in effective governance, lessons learned from what has been tested and tried, uh, lessons learned from regulation that is known to work. Um, uh, we have options available to both strengthen adaptation in each sector and uh, to reduce emissions by a factor of two globally between now and 2030. And what is missing is finance, a gap of a factor of three to six between what would be needed for these options to be implemented and what is available in terms of climate finance. 
And I think effective governance is also key. Well, let's stay with this effective government, you, you, uh, governance rather. You spoke about France as being kind of on the right track in some ways, as several countries are, but still globally uh, more needed to be done. How difficult is it, Valerie, to meet, uh, to make a consensus when it comes to kind of shared visions and observations? Are we all on the same page? Are we <laughs> differing in some of our ideas of how to tackle this? Because that's key. So my experience in terms of uh, having all governments agreeing on something is from the approval of IPCC reports. Mm -hmm. and, and it has been increasingly challenging, in particular for issues related to mitigation. Um, and the last IPCC synthesis report, based on already agreed material, uh, led to 133 difficult discussions for all governments to support the main scientific findings, which are clearly grounded in evidence. And I would like to highlight the most sensitive issues for me hmm. during these approval sessions. The first one is related to all mentions of fossil fuels. So what is really clear is that cumulative CO2 emissions need to be limited to limit warming. This is a scientific fact. And it also shows that new investment in fossil fuel infrastructure is not consistent with Paris Agreement goal unless these emissions are very strongly abated. That, that's really a strong outcome of the report. But all mentions of fossil fuels were challenged, and there were introductions of vague words, as at COP27, such as unabated emissions instead of fossil fuels, or low emission energy, without accurate definitions of what it means. And this is a challenge in terms of reaching agreement between governments who have different interests including those highly dependent on fossil fuels. And the second example is about livestock. And it's very clear that the food system accounts for about a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. And there are options for action at all steps, including shifting diets for both health benefits and environmental uh, benefits. And so instead of being able to write in such reports plant-based diets, due to governments where the agro-industry sector and meat export is very powerful. It was transformed to sustainable and balanced diets, which doesn't mean exactly the same thing when mm. you explain it uh, to a, a normal person in the street. So it gives, this gives a few examples where you can still see obstruction, in, even in a scientific document, having plain language interpretation of what the evidence is. You, you know, you, you, you've in part answered some of my next question, Valerie, because I was going to ask you about, you know, uh, COP summits. So, for example, you, you made uh, reference to the, the COP15. We know that last week in Paris there was this huge UN summit uh, with 175 people, uh, 75 countries, I should say, here wanting to kind of sign a plastic treaty. There are big conferences taking place. For you, how useful are they concretely in moving things forward? Because there are those who think, well, these are talking shops, essentially. And, and asking questions about what actually comes out of them. For you, how useful are they in moving forward with climate change? I see these intergovernmental meetings as important to share at least a common state of scientific knowledge to inform decision makings. And then, if governments are not prepared before these meetings to make any progress or advance, then nothing happens. Mm. And um, two weeks ago, I was also invited to speak at the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, which for the first time, it's quite surprising, organized a climate day to the initiative of Finland. And there were numerous scientific presentations, and at least the diplomats from each country who have different geopolitical interests had a presentations of a, a common understanding of what is at stake. And then you have, you know, um, national interests that play a key role in what can be acceptable or not, despite, uh, for instance, Antarctica in that case, supposed to be an area for uh, peace and science, but it's increasingly challenged due to national interest, for instance, for krill fisheries or for very expensive and highly emitting tourism. So um, I just want to flag a few recent examples. I think that COP26 uh, was really interesting in a strong emphasis being made by the UK diplomats uh, on uh, putting science at the heart of many aspects. Mm. And it allowed to reflect, for instance, the rate of CO2 uh, emission reductions required to limit warming 
at close to 1.5 degrees Celsius for the first time in a COP decision. But this was a strong push from UK uh, diplomats to ground things in science. COP27 uh, put an emphasis on loss and damage, and this was informed by recent IPCC reports on you know, the advances in the science of attribution of high impact events for which you can now assess how much they have been made more likely or more intense uh, due to human-induced climate change. And it also calls, vice versa, for science advances. Um, in 1990, first IPCC reports, it was very hard to know who emitted greenhouse gases. Emission inventories, and I think the sector where they are most reliable are the energy sector now, globally. There need to be advances for the land sector. Now with the conversation and um, financial mechanism for loss and damage, I think it also calls for an inventory of impacts and advances in recognized methodologies for loss and damage attribution uh, to human-induced climate change so that policy needs are also best informed by robust scientific information. And, and so um, just what I wanted to highlight is the importance of the spaces for all governments to agree, but also the importance to have high ambition within each country and the need of civil society, the private sector, to be part of that momentum due to the fact that within uh, UNFCCC, one single government can block the consensus of all. It also matters not just to have this, but also alliances and organizations of higher ambition that lead by example and push forward and inspire others. I mean, Valerie, um, as a climate scientist, there's so much to ask you. I mean, it's, it, it's vast. Um, a challenge for you, just a, a really kind of short answer, if you will. This is an extra question I'd like to ask you. What do you think should be first on the agenda at the 2028 uh, COP that we will talk about a bit later on? But I just want to get kind of a really short sense of you. It's very the simple. Agenda? Fossil fuels subsidies. And we can see um, with the invasion of Ukraine how much the temptation is huge for governments to subsidize fossil fuels in all, all countries, phasing out subsidies. And then an agreement on phasing out not just coal, but also oil and gas. And I, I think without touching that, uh, you would not see um, um, COP28 to have any significant advance. Okay. And it's an opportunity that it is led by a country strongly dependent for its economy on fossil fuels, but which has engaged economical diversification earlier than others. Okay, thank you very much for that, that succinct answer, Valerie, and, and sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, Philip, it will be good to bring you in here, just as we kind of keep this momentum going uh, about uh, the energy sector and, and the kind of changes. I wanted to get a sense from you what you think will be a game changer uh, when it comes to, to tackling climate change. What's actually going to make the difference in your view, Philip? Well, thank you for this question. Well, game changer. Uh, for me, uh, the game changer and probably builds up on what Valérie said, is to have an implementation plan. Uh, basically, in the energy sectors, we have clear objectives. Uh, they are quantified. Solution exists. Uh, we have low carbon energy supply. We have smart energy management system. We have storage system. We have energy demand strategies. We, we saw that uh, during this winter. But there are a number of, uh, of obstacles. Uh, first, we have to convert an old energy model to a new one. Uh, with a centralized and uh, controllable production, uh, with an aggregated consumption to a more diffuse, distributed, uh, low-carbon production, individual producers. You can be a producer with a, a PV panel on your rooftop. Um, there is also uh, regulation allows self-consumption. So we have a number of things that uh, should be uh, activated to uh, to speed up the implementation plan. And then there are also other obstacles that Valerie mentioned is the interest of each country, of course. Um, one issue with this new energy model system is uh, it involves multiple actors. Uh, we have uh, nation scale. I would not refer to even you know, European scale, but even you know, national, national scale. Uh, we have subnational 
uh, actors uh, in France administrative regions, communities, and as I said, you can be a producer. Uh, so we have individuals, and we have to develop a, uh, a method to ensure compatibility with a national low carbon strategy, for example, in France, with the deployment of solutions in the on the ground with the community by the communities the administrative regions and so on and so forth and the tools do not necessarily uh, exist and we also have to develop relevant governance that uh, make the link easier more fluid between let's say the national national level and the territories and the communities and finally i would say it was also more or less mentioned by uh, by Valérie, uh, we, we have to avoid silo thinking. Um, energy impacts uh, water, okay, which is needed, for example, to cool down um, uh, for cooling system. Uh, it impacts food, it impacts land, it impacts biodiversity. And so we need also to develop a holistic sy systemic uh, thinking uh, to avoid uh, well, the maladaptation, I would say, mm. uh, uh, with cross-sectoral uh, approaches and involves all the, uh, the key stakeholders. Okay, so in terms of, uh, I'll ask you a, a next question about the chicken or the egg, okay, and, and your thoughts on what came first. Was it the chicken or the egg? So would you say that, you know, it's new regulation that's leading scientific discoveries, or do you think that it's scientific discoveries that are informing the policies? Which, which comes first for you? <laughs> uh, well, the question for, was for the first time. Now, I think we are in, a, I, I hope, a virtuous cycle loop. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but so, well, my first comment will be self-regulating word is not adopted, adapted uh, to uh, climate urgency. Uh, we need regulation to enforce, to accelerate transformation. That's my first point. Second, and it was largely uh, uh, said by Valérie, facts, scientific facts are needed to support decision making. And that's where science comes into play, so they provide facts. Uh, the uh, science uh, informs on facts at international level with IPCC, sub-regional level with the uh, MEDEC, which was mentioned by Eric, so uh, for the Mediterranean area, uh, at national level with the Au Conseil pour le Climat in France, or even uh, uh, really at the, at the level of, of regions uh, in France, we have the Groupe Regionaux uh, uh, d'Experts sur le Climat. So uh, there, we have, let's say, plenty of uh, assessment, scientific assessment at all levels, uh, which are really uh, steered to, uh, to, the, to, to decision makers, okay, with the uh, summaries for policymakers. So this is the first link, I mean, one way. But of course, the opposite way is also true. Uh, implemented or planned, um, uh, uh, policies uh, are assessed um, by uh, a scientist following rigorous scientific approach. Uh, it, with, between two uh, IPCC reports, uh, these assessments enrich, especially in group three, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the reports, and so there is a back and forth between science and policy. So mm -hmm. it's, it's no longer, I would say, a question of egg and chicken. Uh, and so I but for this cycle to be virtuous, I think there must be confidence. And we saw in the past years and months um, difficulties from the scientific community to convey messages, Absolutely. facts. And so uh, for this cycle to be virtuous, uh, we need to have mutual trust uh, for things to well, get but, better. But I think, I think you, you, you raise an interesting point, Philippe. We're not always speaking the same language. I'm not talking about who's speaking French or who's speaking English. I think we don't always have the same priorities if we're talking about kind of, you know, policy makers and scientists and how we kind of get them to have the, the, the same vision. How do you think that can be made easier? Is it about kind of more panels like this? How do we, how do we kind of get people on the same page? Well, training is key. Uh, we're, we're dealing with, a, with complex phenomena first. And I'm also uh, often interacting with policymakers, decision makers, um, and 
when we address things in details, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to, I mean, we, we, what's the level of information uh, we need to convey for it to be operationalized. Mm. operationalized. And this, sometimes it's tricky. Indeed, uh, it because is. Because it's very systemic, very non-linear in the uh, scientific world. Uh, and so we need uh, places where we interact. So yes, panels are key, uh, but small meetings, just we, we have to address a problem. How would, well, well we have a problem to address. We, can, we, we, we meet with decision makers, scientists, which will give the facts, their vision of the knowledge we have on this problem. And we, yes, we have to multiply this. Otherwise, we won't be able to implement. So bridging this gap between what the scientist is saying, but what the audience or the policymaker is actually hearing. Again, there is a, at times a discrepancy. Uh, you touched, Philippe, on kind of building these common frames of reference. Uh, the role of the IPCC, for example, is key in that. It's the ability to measure actions and their impacts as well as enabling stakeholders, is that the way that you offer uh, alternative solutions? <clears throat> For me, non-binding frames of reference are good but are not enough. Mm. Um, there is a need for enforcing regulation to speed up implementation of adaptation and mitigation measures. And we saw that recently, two weeks ago, I think. There was this, you know, insurance, uh, the uh, insurance world. So in, big insurers are part of an alliance, the Net Zero Alliance. And uh, so they were, they were under pressure by the US Republican politicians. Uh, and they fear uh, antitrust lawsuits uh, as they face criticism uh, to unfairly hit oil and gas uh, industry. So if there is no enforcing laws, uh, that forbids clearly, and it was said, um, uh, of new oil and gas projects, uh, the actors will, be, will fear uh, on ground to, to move forward because there won't be legal uh, frame to act. And so for me, we, we really need regulation to enforce some actions. But enforcing uh, is so complex though, Philippe. Oh, yeah, I, I don't see <laughs> I'm not saying it's simple. <laughs> no, so you won't be, hear that word from me. Uh, and so regarding measuring uh, uh, impacts, uh, so can help identifying obstacles. Uh, but when you say alternative solutions, sometimes you have ill-implemented solutions. Mm. That doesn't mean that the solution is not the good one. It's ill-implemented. And I think, for example, uh, avoiding the funding uh, of new oil and gas project is, uh, cannot be uh, achieved because there is a lack of regulation enforcing it. Um, and of course, yes, to their also uh, uh, measuring impacts can also lead to new alternative solutions. Just in terms of illustration, it would be good to have an idea of one of these ill-implemented solutions that you're talking about. What comes to mind when you think of something that hasn't perhaps been uh, implemented the way it should have been? <laughs> so what is missing? What's missing, you might say. <laughs> uh, I, it's difficult to give you, uh, you know, what is missing. As I told you, that there are solutions that exist but need to be implemented wisely depending on, on the sector's mobility question of mobility, so uh, what, is, uh, what should work with batteries, what should work with hydrogen, what should work with uh, synthetic fuel, well that's, it. so uh, give, a, uh, uh, so we have to go sector by sector uh, needing energy, so to implement the, the, the most, let's say, suited and relevant solutions, okay. Uh, we hear about hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen everywhere, but green hydrogen everywhere it means a lot of energy and green energy to, uh, to produce this hydrogen. So hydro hydrogen cannot be the solution for everything. Uh, so we, go, we have to go sectors by sectors and identify uh, in detail, and that's where uh, uh, we, we have to mobilize all the stakeholders, uh, I would say sectors by sectors, uh, uh, Problems to face by problems to face, let's say, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to address it the, the most properly.
All right, Philip, thank you very much uh, for, for responding to those questions there. Uh, Lawrence, uh, Philip spoke about kind of mobilising uh, the stakeholders, if you will. I want to get a sense from you whether regulating uh, policy, does that necessarily equate to uh, combating uh, climate change and, I suppose, reaching uh, net zero uh, carbon? So, of course, it's not because you have stated the law uh, at national level or European level. You know that at international level, we have very weak means uh, to define laws. We are defining commitments, and then we ensure that at least we put pressure on each other uh, nation to implement that at national level. So that's the philosophy of the Paris Agreement. Huh? Every country has to define their climate laws to implement the commitments they made, in particular consistent with 1.5 degrees. But doesn't mean that, as Philippe said, that because we have a law, it is implemented. I had long conversation, for example, with a very bright African parliamentarians who were saying, we have all the laws needed in most of our countries in Africa, but if they are not implemented, we are not able to do oversight. And at that stage where there have been, you look at the commitments of many countries, there is more than 185 countries that have committed to net zero emission by 2050 or, or soon after. Uh, so the commitments are there. Commitment 2030 are still lacking, as uh, Valérie said. We are, we are really lagging behind. Glasgow was a good start, but not really in terms of uh, increasing ambition nation by nation and what is lacking and unfortunately will ne probably not be delivered by, by this year. But then the problem of transparency and oversight and control is really, really important. And uh, I, I am unfortunately in these things since now 30 years, trying to make the climate agenda high on the level of politics. And you see that it's coming now uh, at a moment where of course it's there Everybody, I'm very happy that in this institution you are putting climate change at the core of your curriculum. It was not the case years ago, so it's good. It's good that in many students are protesting if they think that their curriculum is not enough and the policy. So that means that we are, the, the climate change is very high on the agenda. Yes, that some laws are biting, but now we see, uh, of course, uh, a pushback. And so we need the conjunction of policies, and the policies at European level are almost there, um, mostly not in agriculture and food, unfortunately, but for the rest, uh, they have improved enormously in the last years, and in particular last year because of the war. But we need the politics and the people. And as Valérie said, we need on top of that the geopolitics. And, and really, we have had good phases and bad phases in, to this long fight for combating climate change since, what say, the convention in 1992 uh, or, or the Kyoto Protocol for what was a strong moment. But then you see that the, uh, we have high and lows. I can say it's very difficult to understand the situation today. Uh, we have a number of laws. They are not implemented, mostly not enough. The, I think the commitments were too broad on the long term, not specifically on the year-to-year -year emission reduction. And that, of course, the discussion we had at the high-level um, groups that we have at the HCC, or that many other climate commit, uh, assessment committees are having at many, in many places. But then what we see is that each time there is, of course, a progress, like for electric vehicles, for example, or heat pumps, or renewable energy targets, you, of course, we are now suffering a lot of pushback at different levels. I am struck, Teresa Ribera, a very good friend of mine, is now fighting in his own country because of the push, a political pushback against the deployment of electric vehicles and against what she wants to say, which is a phasing out gas. So, you know, Spain has a lot of gas, not because they are producing that, but because they are importing it. So this, this is a politicizing. It's now climate change is a political issues at national level, and of course, it was the case already at global level. So I think we need consensus, but we need at least mobilization. And that's why now uh, the citizen mobilization is so central. Practically, as Philippe said, 
being actors, agents of the change, but at the same time pressing on the political levels that uh, uh, climate change should not be, like it is in US, for example, a totally polarized issue. Now it's about identity politics. When you are in the US and Republican, you don't believe in climate change. At least that's the official position. And you should not do anything about climate change because you should not touch on the oil and gas sector. It was not the case in Europe until now. It's become to be a more tricky. You have seen in Germany lately, the last weeks, a pushback against the a regulation, a law on banning gas boilers in houses and, and just replacing them by, by heat pumps. We see that in Italy on electric vehicle deployment and now, as I mentioned, in Spain. Uh, I think this begin to be, and it's very, very dangerous. It's just not anymore based on science, but on political and cultural battle, which is totally crazy, but it is what is happening. That's why the citizen has a key role at that stage. It was different until now. Myself, my colleagues, we have been fighting for the Paris Agreement. We have been fighting for regulation at European level or other countries. Uh, and that's very important and necessary. We have been welcoming the voluntary agreement from the financial sector, for the business sector, with of course doubts on how much this voluntary would, would stay. And Philippe mentioned the pushback in the US about these voluntary agreements, seeing that a number of financial investors are saying, oh, we, we, don't, we don't now agree with strong commitments in decarbonizing our portfolio. So, that's, and why? It's because now it has changed the field of the, what we have to do. And again, pushing more on regulation is important, but we have to work on the politics. L Lawrence, I, I hear you talking a, a lot about uh, the frustrations. I mean, and obviously all of our panel, your work is, you know, to be probably on a daily basis involved in, in working to combat climate change. For the average person who is maybe doing, doing their best, they're recycling, uh, they're watching their carbon footprint, they're, you know, maybe taking their scooter or their bike to work. Th there's a sense of frustration. We're doing all of this, but still, you know, the laws are in place, but not necessarily being implemented. How do you combat that kind of frustration and keep people mobilized and want to keep doing their very best to combat climate change? I think it's a, it's a real question. How do we get over that? Uh, one, I think we have a perception that people don't get it right, which is not true. They don't get access to the way to implement that. It's important you, to say. You cannot, if you ha don't have public transport, you can, and you are living in the suburbs of any big cities, uh, you cannot but take your car. That, there is no way. Uh, it's the same for the infrastructure for electric vehicle. But mostly, it's an issue of equity. When the Gilets jaunes <coughs> movement happened in France, and everybody said, oh, they are against the carbon tax. It's a movement of the people against elite policies, because climate policies are elite policies. It was not true. I discussed even with the initiators of this movement, and they were just saying it's unequal. And there have been very good work by, in particular by your laboratory in the, in the, in the Ecole Nationale Supérieure on the economic department that shows that the 1% the wealthier person have a carbon footprint that is 20 to 25 higher than the lowest income. And it's true in every country of the world. Of course, U.S. being well is on the high level. So the equity dimension is absolutely central, plus the ability to change your behavior. How you get, get healthy food when the, all the agricultural subsidies are based on intensive agriculture and the use of heavily uh, intensive uh, fertilizers and pesticides? How you can have cheap food affordable food that is a good quality. When, when you look at the support in, for example, in Europe, everything is again, uh, just in favor of the fossil fuel subsidies. Last year, in 2022, Europe spent almost 800 billion of subsidies to the fossil fuel consumption for industry, for consumers, for the agricultural sector. How much money we have spent for the transition. So the problem of the consistency of policies and politics and the accessibility and the equity factor is the number one. You cannot ask people to have agency 
if they feel that there is a carbon tax on diesel or uh, on, the, on petrol, but you don't have carbon tax on flights. Even in, in France, we have a small one. How you can explain that the private jet doesn't pay any tax? It's just impossible to accept. And, 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 and on top of that, uh, and, and of course, uh, and we are in a very difficult period, very frankly, so I understand the reaction of your students vis-a-vis -vis the oil and gas sector, why I understand that. All the COP28 preparation, how interesting probably could be, is about oil and gas is part of the solution. When the International Energy Agency is repeating now from now the last five years that no new investment in oil and gas is consistent with a budget uh, limiting the temperature to 1.5 and the carbon budget. So I think there is this dissonance, and it's not about cognition. Everyone knows what it's about. There is not a problem of science. It's a problem of consistency and honesty, in my way, inconsistent in politics. Governments are afraid to take strong regulation because they don't have enough, I think, capacity to debate with the citizen and having an informed discussion with their societies. But equity is a central condition for that. Teresa was explaining how they dealt with a coal phase out that is now in the law in Spain. They did that, preparing that with the trade unions, with the region, and in a way proposing the solution of, uh, in a way, transforming the work and the, and the ability of the region to, to transfer, to transition, before any dates of the coal mining closing. Equity, and then it's okay. In the northern region, of Spain, people are just happy because they know what will happen to them and they, will, they are part of the solution. So this is really, really central. The good thing is, in a way, for Europe that the war in Ukraine has wake up. The investment in solar uh, energy and in wind energy last year were skyrocketing. We have doubled uh, the investment in solar only last year, uh, slower in the wind sector, but coming on. And there is a sense that energy security and climate are coming together. And that's why I hope there will be more consistency in general. You raise a very good point, Lawrence, about this idea of consistency. And I just want to kind of unpack two things that you said. The first is this question of equity, uh, which is, is, is key. And then this kind of double standard. And you said, you know, that the private jet doesn't necessarily pay the carbon tax. People don't understand that. You know, how come I'm, you know, having extra uh, money added on to my, my bill when I pay for my ticket, but somebody who's got a, a great deal more money isn't? I think that that's a real problem. A lot of focus has been placed on, uh, you know, the need to embrace cleaner energy sources, right? You made reference to countries who have a real difficulty doing that, who are not able necessarily to move away from fossil fuels uh, quite that quickly. It's easier said than done. How uh, would you say that these diverse opinions kind of play out at the EU uh, level? So the fact that some countries are able and others are struggling because of this lack of equity that you've made reference to, Lance. Well, it's true that when you look at the global perspective in Europe, still 45% of the energy produced, electricity, pro the power produces out of fossil fuel sources, in particular coal, in particular for the eastern part of Europe. But this is, that, that's why the, the global context, of course, is very important. This has changed and why, how politics and geopolitics are mingled with this. Talking to the Polish actors, only about climate change didn't work because the coal region were very strong and the government has invested a lot towards these regions. Then, talking about air pollution make a huge difference because then a number of cities like Warsaw or Krakow, for example, Poland, is a big, you know, is a big laggard into climate policies in Europe. But then, the Polish citizen began to say, wow, coal is very, very bad for our air pollution. And, and that has made enormous progress. And then the war happened. And then the dependence from the gas and from the coal from Russia for Poland means that renewable energy was the solution to energy security. And because they wanted to cut all the provision of oil and gas to Europe, not only to them, but for the region. And so that has changed totally the discussion in Poland. So I think we have to understand all these factors and see at least on what factors we can, 
we can, we can use to accelerate the transition. And really, the Ukraine war has been a turbocharger of the energy transition in Europe for, of course, unexpected reasons. Even if the Russia situation on climate change is really dire, as Valerie knows well, because now the permafrost and all this, just a, just a catastrophe. I was discussing in a group with President Zelensky yesterday afternoon because of the dam uh, disruption and the ecocide that is happening now in Ukraine. I think uh, climate now, change and security are totally <coughs> linked. And uh, I appreciate very much what you said, Philippe. We could not say we'll repeat the same mistake like we did, for example, for ozone layer. We have a, a big advocate here in the room. We went from CFC to HFC, and we haven't understand that we have to have a systemic approach. And we need now to have a systemic approach on biodiversity, water, food, etc., because everything is linked. And I think if we, even for renewable energy, if we follow the same extractive model than we had from the past, the raw material, the rare earth, will create many more problems or as much problems in a different biodiversity, human rights, it's already happening in Congo, for example. So we have to think differently. And I think it's essential that in this new generation of innovation, we think systematically, systemically, and with the stakeholders, as it was said before. Laurent, we, we spoke a little bit about uh, Valerie and, and Philip about uh, this idea of a shared vision. And it would be good to get a sense from you uh, about how we go about getting this shared vision. You gave an example of Poland. You said, you know, when we spoke about fossil fuels, we didn't necessarily get the engagement that we might have wanted. Whenever, when we spoke <coughs> about air pollution, it was the declic, people suddenly sat up and took notice. Is it about finding a narrative that resounds, that resonates uh, with political, uh, with particular countries before? Or, uh, we, we try and get the shared vision because what interests Poland might not be what interests uh, Kenya, for example, or what interests India, for example. Do, do you see what I mean? Do we need particular narratives before we can get a shared vision? Well, it's very important. Narrative is everything, you know, because we have to shape expectations. And uh, I think on the, what is really new and shared is a narrative on climate impacts. It was not there. <coughs> People didn't feel it. Now you don't see any head of state that would not comment on the impact of climate change at home. And that's a big uh, game changer in my view. The second thing is, which is true, is the narrative on the you know, a green future was always very, very technical. Uh, and e even in the climate community, which now I'm part of, uh, we were talking about, you know, electric vehicles and uh, tur wind turbines and solar panels. That's not a narrative that can incentivize people to dream. Right? It's very, very technical. It's useful, but not, not really a, a future. So the future, that's why the future has to be embedded in the agency of citizens. That's why I feel that decentralized energy is a very, very important <laughs> democratic element. What I think, and I was absolutely fascinated by an article by Martin Wolf, which is, of course, a, a journalist, uh, an editorialist, uh, very well known in the Financial Times, and not, you know, not a revolutionary one by far. And he was saying, we know we have to solve the system, the, the problem of climate change, through citizen assemblies everywhere. I was puzzled. You know, I have been chairing the committee from the French Citizen Assembly on Climate. It was as a strong experience for me as was uh, leading the negotiation for the Paris Agreement on climate. And why? Because when you give the space to discussion, to information, to citizens, the platform you were talking, they elaborate the narratives themselves. And that's why we have to open discussion, debate, democratic discussion is really the condition for the solution, so the, for the, all the actors for the societies, whether it is in Kenya or in France or uh, in Czech Republic, anywhere. Uh, it, it is because of that. So I think that maybe that the politician would understand they cannot dictate that from top down. And you know, have been in the prime minister office a number of years, and you see that you are, of course, the object of many pressures, and you have to, in a way, try to find a line between all these pressures and interests. 
So that cannot solve for a quick energy transition or an ecological transition. You need to have the society uh, not only demanding it, but acting for it. You know, governments are very rarely uh, ahead of the societies. That doesn't happen. Uh, so I think, uh, the, and that's a huge thing for universities, being the place where you, you contribute to the education and the, in a way the agency of all students to go further and be the one talking and be in pushing that form of more democratic decision. I don't see any other solution. Oh. That this one, if we want to be at the past. And no, when I see note, many countries in Africa you see, which are supposed to cling to fossil fuel, it's always the government statements is more rarely the youth movement statements. And we can see that all the time. I think you raise a really interesting uh, point about democracy and, and certainly this question of uh, citizens' assembly. I just want to put this to the, to the audience. A, a show of hands if you would or have perhaps already participated in a citizen assembly where you kind of get to put your point across <laughs> to climate change. Have you already or, or is that something that you'd be prepared to do? A show of hands if that's something that you might participate in. Okay, so... So most people might be interested in doing that. A, a, a perfect time to just remind you that, of course, our conference today, our second international conference entitled Reflections for Climate Change 2023, is interactive. That barcode up there, or QR code, I should say, is waiting for you to click and send us a question, and our IP Paris students uh, will ask those questions in about... 20 minutes' time, so please do uh, get your questions into us. Thank you so much, uh, Laurence, and we'll have a chance to kind of talk together a little bit later. <coughs> I, I do want to bring in a, a, a different perspective now. Estelle, you, of course, work for Veolia. In terms of infrastructure, it will be good to kind of walk us through what companies like Veolia are doing uh, to kind of mitigate climate change. How does their role play out in all of this, Estelle? Um, thank you. Before answering this question, uh, you know, you're, you're right, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm, I would be like the representative of companies in whatever way. Uh, although Veolia is a very specific, you know, spot because we, of course, have our own impact and mitigation and I will explain what we do. But actually part of our, our, our role and actually our mission, our purpose is to help cities and companies to decarbonize. Uh, so it, it's part of our mission. Um, just wanted to, to I, I couldn't agree more with a few things you've said and uh, on the, how do we accelerate because it looks to me like it's exactly what we're talking about in the last uh, half an hour or so. Uh, you know, policies are needed, uh, certainly companies I think are and I'll explain how we could contribute uh, and citizens are absolutely paramount to actually accelerate. And actually, let's be honest, they put pressure on the, the politician, they put pressure on companies, and, you know, and in the end, you know, it accelerates the pace. So we've, uh, we've conveyed a survey with ELAB on 25 countries across the globe, on 25,000 people, all type of social backgrounds, uh, and all the large, uh, large um, countries you can think of, from India to Australia to the Gulf, and so on and so forth. And the conclusions are super clear. In terms of the realization that, in a way, we have a problem as the humanity, that's it, tick. I'm not saying it's 100% and we still have a lot of effort to steal, but there is an element of compared to five years ago and 10 years ago, and it probably the effect of the COP, you know, that, you know, plus probably the effect of events, uh, because it's very different to think that there is a problem than to live through a big fire here uh, or the drought in France last summer. And suddenly people click, okay, this is happening now. Uh, and the question we've asked, uh, uh, probably more interestingly, is, you know, uh, uh, are you ready to, to make something about it? You know, and what are the conditions for it? So by a vast majority, people in the world tell us that they're ready to make some effort. Uh, they're, they're ready to contribute and they've understood that the cost of inaction is higher than the cost of acting now. So that's the good news. Uh, but they tell us that there are some conditions to act and to make those efforts. One is exactly what you said, equity, shared effort, uh, and not opposing you know, those and these. Uh, the second one uh, is that there is no, uh, I mean, the health, uh, and again, to your point, you know, is some uh, 
teaser for action which is even stronger than many others. Uh, when you talk about the planet or when you talk about you know, your son or daughter's uh, health, you can imagine that one had an impact on clicking which is much, very much more powerful than the other. And the third thing, and that's where I wanted to, to, to come to, is the fact that they, they're not so sure what they can do. In a way, they want us to talk about solution and what they should do, what they can do. So let's be concrete. So yes, we have a problem with Gomba Marwe, and I think they've understood uh, to the vast majority. Uh, but okay, what can I do? If it's just you know to turn off the lights when I exit my you know apartment, they have understood that it's not enough. So I think to explain what are the t type of solution that they are uh, at display for a citizen, for a company, for a city, and at whatever level is absolutely critical. Uh, and the first condition is they want that it's efficient and consistent. So the, uh, the kind of trendy communication tools, which is 0.01% of the solution, they've understood that it's bullshit, sorry. Uh, so they want to understand you know, what the scale of it is and can it you know, make a difference. So I think that's a very interesting you know, confirmation, probably, to everything we've said about the, how do we speed up. Uh, companies have a role to play. Uh, so I run a company which has you know, this dual element of we have a footprint, we, ha we emit CO2 if you want, and of course we want the trajectory to go down, and we're helping our customer to reduce our CO2 footprint. And uh, I will talk about the, the second, but of course we wouldn't be uh, talking about that if we were not applying to ourselves if you want, you know, what we are uh, trying and do. And a good example was, you know, coal. We've inherited from coal fire plants uh, in Eastern Europe, which are uh, uh, supporting a district heating scheme. Uh, so basically, it heats uh, houses when it's minus 10 in the, uh, in the winter. So the let's just turn it off is not an option. You know, like uh, you have an essential service behind it. Uh, and by the way, district heating is much more efficient energy-wise than you no know, individual heating, but that's another story. So that's it. Uh, we had another. Uh, solution, easy one, and just wanted to share what are the, uh, the situation when you're on the company, uh, would be to sell it, probably more to a private s somebody or whatever, uh, which therefore wouldn't be, would be totally under the radar of all and everybody. That's an easy solution. That's not who we are, uh, but that's an easy solution. So in a way, I would always be super careful about banning this and that if it's just to find it somewhere else which is less under the radar. That's my piece of, I don't know, like uh, experience that I wanted to share. So we decided to invest, and that's massive. It's 1.5 billion uh, until 2030, uh, 2030 uh, so in just a few years, uh, to get rid of that in Europe. And we've already invested 400 million, and we've changed uh, one in Braunschweig uh, actually this uh, winter, and another one Cherov in, uh, in Czech Republic. So is it perfect? No, it's not. Uh, but actually, we're putting our mouth, uh, where our uh, word where our mouth is, and I think that's a super, super important uh, to walk the talk and actually do. And as you said, not in 2050, because it would have been super easy to say, okay, I commit to a net zero in 2050, which of course we do. But I don't think that's enough. There is an element of timing. What do we do in the next 10 years? What do we do in the next 20? What do we do in the next 30? So having some like, if we can do something now, let's just do it. Uh, so that's uh, the first bit of it. Uh, of course, we've done a lot on the methane element as well. And uh, the reverse is actually that we're helping our customer to decarbonize. 14 million tons of carbon we've helped our customer reduce just last year only. And how do we do that? Uh, through uh, recycling plastic uh, instead of uh, you know, producing out of oil. This is minus 75%. Of course, it's best if you don't waste plastic at all. But once it's done, you know, it's better to be recycled. Uh, by replacing you know, uh, fossil fuel by you know, uh, you know, renewable uh, type of fuels that we produce, for instance, from uh, non-recyclable waste or wastewater. And I will multiply the example. So I think uh, consistency uh, is important. Uh, and think how we could speed up uh, with involving companies as well as the citizens. I mean, you spoke at the beginning, uh, Estelle, about, uh, and we've been speaking today, about getting uh, people on board. How do you disseminate this information so people are aware of the kind of things that they can be doing to be greener, to you know, be promoting greater uh, m m green mobility? How, how does your company do that? Uh, 
Uh, we, we do it uh, directly. We do it via, you know, like uh, elected uh, members, you know, at city level, at national level. Uh, in a way, we provide the materials. A company like Veolia provides the technical innovation uh, solutions, uh, and then we talk and talk and talk about it. Uh, so we've launched, for instance, a few weeks ago, uh, um, a specific uh, scheme, uh, which is a bit like the echo watt, uh, but the echo watt of water, because we've discovered in France that we may be lacking water one day, and it's uh, the effect, of course, of uh, global warming and, and other stuff. Uh, long story short is we've put all the materials we have about how to save water at home in an industry, in a way, to the general public. And, you know, and I've signed a few partnerships with uh, cities here and companies there uh, to kind of bring them with us. Uh, so, do I have a magic wand? No. Uh, do you have a kind of a fighting spirit with some optimism into it? Yes. In a way, I, uh, I'd rather that if, if the, the impact of all that is, okay, we don't have the solution for everything, so let's, let's just quit, would be the worst outcome possible. Uh, so I'm more the, okay, we have already something available here, so let's act on it and let's act as quickly as possible with me more my, my motto, probably. And the second element is, uh, and if you, I talk, of course, as a company's perspective, uh, you've mentioned the money, the lack of money. Uh, it's a glass half full, half empty, uh, in my opinion. As in, there is plenty of money which is not used uh, to be uh, connected with, let's say, green project, to be a little bit uh, generic here. Uh, is it enough if we were to do everything we need to do? Probably not. Uh, but there is a lot which is not used. Uh, so my question is, how do we already, you know, like uh, scale up uh, this? And uh, we have two uh, hindrances to this money being used. Uh, one is, uh, is the fact that this money always wants, or very often, wants to be in the green, not in the greening as in uh, not in the transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you bet by, I don't know, 80% CO2, you still have 20% uh, of CO2 remaining, and a lot of those funds are allocated to only kind of neutrality altogether. I think there is a mistake here, which is we need, we need to understand what we should do with what we have already. We have already cities which are existing, so I can dream of a of 100% of uh, uh, energy positive building in, uh, in the greater Paris. I could dream of that, but we already have an existing base. So my question is, what do we do with the base to do you know, the trajectory down? Same goes with industry. Should we close all the industry we have in France or should we transform them to, again, uh, reduce their footprint? I'm a great believer that we should transform them and help them transform. And at times, uh, there is a lack of understanding that the importance is actually the trajectory down rather than you have a, the perfection on one side and the baddies on the other, if you want, so what uh, I hear which you is saying, quite important. What, what I hear you saying is, you know, work with what we have ultimately, if I had to summarize what you were, rather than kind of scrapping things. And, and speed up. And, and speed up, absolutely. How does that tie in with national policy? I mean, is there a kind of meeting? We've spoken about discrepancies, uh, you know, different ideas, different visions, and having a hard time marrying them up. How does what your company is doing uh, fall in line with national policy? Um, so, uh, national policy, international, as in EU policies, are absolutely needed. You know, we need the framework. We need to know what the ambition for the country will be in the energy mix in the next, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, and to make bets. So, in a way, stability and clarity of the framework is paramount for companies to invest. Uh, otherwise, if you think that in six months it's going to change and go into another direction, you will wait for things to be stabilized. So polities, stable and implemented, you know, it would be the counter example of your uh, African example, which you've just mentioned uh, earlier on. So uh, in, I can't remember which country you, you mentioned. Uh, so stability of framework is important. And the second one uh, is um, uh, probably simplicity. Uh, because uh, if a policy uh, and pragmatism uh, Policy is important, as in, okay, this is a target of CO2 in France uh, in, say, 10 years. 
then the how is as important. Okay, how do we get there? So you have, you know, like a sector by sector uh, series of policies which needs to be consistent. But then simplicity. Uh, okay, you know, you have a lot of subsidies uh, and the good ones, if I may, uh, which needs uh, years and years of procedures to get are impossible to understand. And at times, you know, like uh, you need four years now uh, to connect biogas to the gas grid in France. Okay, I'm talking about biogas, so uh, not natural gas that you extract. Is it absolutely, you know, like uh, what we can do best? Probably not. So in a way, we need uh, consistency over the long term, uh, and we need simplicity of accessing to those policies. And then we need the citizens to be embarked, we need NGOs, uh, and we need companies to implement as long as this signal is clear and consistent. I mean, of course, uh, the citizens on board, and again, that, that's something that, that, that Laurence was talking a great deal about. Uh, Eric LeBay earlier spoke about uh, sustainability being at the heart, uh, particularly at the campus, IP Paris. Um, in terms of sustainability, what kind of solutions are being found uh, in the work that you're doing? And I think you've touched on some of the challenges, but if you could give us a concrete kind of obstacle uh, that you're working to overcome, that would be interesting. Yeah, I, I said, you know, we need to be concrete if we want people to be on bark, so I will be. Um, so, uh, if you talk about energy, uh, a few things. First, uh, the best energy is the energy uh, you don't consume. So, uh, avoid uh, sparing energy. Uh, and energy, so a typical building in Europe, when we put, uh, we are able with sensors and digital and monitoring of the buildings, the large ones, say hospitals and public buildings, to save 15, 20% of energy by monitoring the building more closely. So uh, the digital can help. So that's one, uh, avoiding to uh, spare energy. A uh, second one, uh, think about heat and not only electricity. Uh, basically, the energy consumption is half heat, half electricity today. Electricity will be uh, higher, but we have a lot of spare heat, uh, which can be used uh, for industrial process and others. So think about heat and spare heat and uh, have the look back. Uh, and then you have, uh, what about the alternative source of energy you can think of? Uh, and of course, everybody can talk about uh, solar panels or, or, or wind turbines. I will talk about uh, less known things. Uh, one is uh, non-recyclable waste, uh, which of course, you know, uh, is only a part of it, because what's recyclable should be recycled, that's a priority, but you still are left with something you'd better, you know, do something with it. And instead of putting it into a landfill, you know, producing energy out of it. Uh, another one will be the biogas. Uh, same if you equip, equip uh, you know, with methanization uh, units, uh, all the, um, what you can do in France on wastewater treatment plant and, uh, and energy from waste, it's 25% of the Russian gas we used to import in France, which can be replaced by biogas. Uh, with just those two elements. And so we're talking here about uh, local energy, decentralized energy at a city or industrial park level, uh, which can be decarbonizing thanks to, in a way, local source of energy. So it ticks the box, of course, of being renewable. It's not perfect, it still emits CO2, but we're, all the examples I gave are minus 60, minus 80% compared to the, pre, the, the level before, if you want of CO2, uh, so it's, it's renewable, uh, it's local, uh, and it's affordable to the social element we've discussed earlier on. Uh, and the local element is paramount in the geopolitical world we, we are talking about here. So I think, you know, those examples are uh, very important. Okay, well, thank you very much, Estelle, for responding to those questions. Uh, Laurence, Philippe and Valérie, uh, I'd like you to stay with us here on stage. Uh, this is a time where we check, uh, ladies and gentlemen, whether all is, is working well. Uh, our Q&A session that we've been talking about, your questions that you've been, uh, you know, uh, nicely kind of filtering in uh, to us. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, up to the stage to ask those questions, Alicia Bassier, she's a, a PhD student at IP Paris in economics, specialising in market design and uncertainty for investments uh, in electricity production capacity uh, for the energy transition. Uh, Alicia, thanks very much. Uh, she's joined on stage by Margot Minaret, first year student in the engineer programme at ENSTA Paris, a, uh, a member school of IP Paris. She's also, uh, quite interestingly, the president of the forum ASTA, an IP Paris Association 
organising a responsible forum uh, every year. Um, let's uh, get questions from you, both Alicia and Margot. I understand that some have been filtered in uh, just for our, for our panel today. What can you tell us, ladies? So, first of all, thank you for the roundtable. It was really helpful. And for our questions, we try to take into account the public remarks. Margot, will you speak into the mic yes. just so we can? <laughs> thank you very much. Sorry. So, our first question is about green hydrogen, which is often presented as a miracle solution uh, to manage the intermittency of renewable energies and new mobilities. But as you said it yourself, Philippe, it cannot be a solution for everything. So, what do you think of low tech options and how can we implement regulations on that? I, I just want to check, were well, you all able to hear that question? Yeah. Green hydrogen. Green hydrogen. And it's an open floor, ladies and gentlemen. Whoever feels, you know, compelled to, please do go ahead and answer. So, so maybe I can start hydrogen. Uh, <laughs> now, regarding... Um, I, 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 first, it's not because hydrogen is not a solution for everything that it can't be a solution for something. So, uh, and definitely we're dealing... It's true for energy and probably for many transformation of our society. It will be a mix of solutions. Uh, there's no miracle solution and uh, regarding hydrogen it may be probably a, a good vector energy vector for let's say heavy transport heavy mobility uh, def my feeling is that it's uh, uh, it won't be true for for uh, uh, for uh, aircraft for um, flights uh, probably more synthetic fuels uh, and for individual cars probably uh, Batteries, even though in the field of batteries, innovation comes out every day. Um, so that's a key message that we are, we need to act in a situation where nothing is stabilized. So there is a lot of transformation, innovation everywhere. So it's it's difficult. We have to admit that that to choose on which solution we have, we, we invest on. Uh, so that would be a, that would be a, a key. So regarding. Regulation, I would say that it's probably out of my expertise. So how do we regulate hydrogen? I'm, I'm not sure I'm able to answer. But anyway, so uh, the, 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 we have really to uh, address which sector needs hydrogen because the hydrogen you want to produce should be green and it needs a lot of energy. And so, of course, the energy that you produce with renewable energy that could be directly into the uh, electric grid will be diverted and go to uh, to produce hydrogen so and as i said we have to think uh in a systemic way when we deal with renewable energies we're also uh, dealing with land footprint so uh which is higher than uh, let's say more conventional uh, energy production systems so we there are many needs now uh, we electrify many things um, and so we have to uh, to make to, to evaluate the synergies and trade-offs we have to make uh, so that uh, producing green hydrogen uh, is sustainable and meets a, uh, meets a need. Thank, thank you for that question, Margot. Elise, do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yes, please yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add something because the question was about regulation, and I've seen that there have been recently debates in the UK about the um, commercial um, um, distribution of uh, personal house gas heaters labeled hydrogen ready. And this might give a sense that if you buy a gas heater, then in the future it could be decarbonized using green hydrogen. However, I understand um, at, at scale this will not be available. So it could lead to a lock-in where people install new gas heaters and will still use fossil gas on the very long term, the life uh, time of the heater. In that case, I would think that regulation, at least in terms of labeling and information to users, would make sense. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie. Thank you, Philippe, uh, as well. Elisa, did you have a question for our panel? Well, the question will not be, do I have a question, but how many do I have? So <laughs> Good, good news. I will try to be synthetic. Uh, as it was already said, many ambitious objectives are currently being pursued at the European level for electricity and energy production. That includes decarbonization, but also energy independence. We talked about Ukraine crisis, nuclear phase-out, ensuring a competitive market, 
So according to you, do you see any of these issues as a priority? And do you think we should tackle everything at once or instead maybe focus on one issue at a time? Laurence, do you want to, do you want to answer that one? Go ahead. Um, one, it's a very good question. Uh, so there is a, normally the ideal way and, and you should find an instrument of regulation for a particular objective, that's the theory. But then, you know, things are not like this because regulation are not implemented fully. And it's very interesting to look at the, the 2020 package of the EU, the, the old one. There was, of course, uh, the carbon markets, was the emission trading system, who has a certain objective in terms of emission reduction because of the carbon budget. Uh, allocated, and then you have the renewable energy target. The two were in total contradiction, meaning that there was too much of the targets of 20% of renewable energy in the package compared to what was uh, aimed at by the ETS. And in a way, what has happened in terms of what has happened in Europe finally was that the renewable energy target was dominating in terms of regulation of commitment what finally should have been obtained through the ETS. So, in a way, it seems totally inconsistent. We should have one instrument and one objective, which was really to tighten the carbon budget. But in a way, people are in the political, they have many critics we can make to them. But at the same time, they are realistic. And you know, uh, you have obstacle for one thing. So if you play with many, you have a little bit of chance to, to get there. So I think, uh, again, it's confusing. Uh, and people can play, there is a playbook for everything. But I think the good thing is now is a picture of we, and anyway, we don't have time anymore. So the, the things that we have to address the different issues altogether, and in particular, it was good to address the reform of the electricity market, which is not there for the moment, because it was in a way uh, totally taking out the the, the idea that the renewable energy was cheaper than gas, at the contrary, because people were paying the same bills or even higher. So I think that seems to me a good thing to really talk about the whole transformation, to have several objectives, and to bet that finally maybe one of them would succeed, even if the other one would be un undermined. It's not logical from a theoretical or an economic point of view at all. It's again the theory. But in practice, finally, I feel it was practically relatively useful. Relatively useful. Philip, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, well, I, I will do down, oh, build on that. Uh, the, um, no, what was really disrupting in the last repo where you directive is that the demand side was, for the first time, really included in uh, energy policies, uh, sobriety or sufficiency, and this highlights the fact that if we want to go fast, we have to mobilize first the citizen. Technology will come, finally, as was said. Uh, it's, it's probably a longer uh, time scale, but we add, uh, due to the uh, Ukraine war, we had to act quickly, and so uh, demand side uh, was uh, included. Uh, it's another call to act quickly. Thank you, Philippe. Go, go ahead, Valerie. Yeah, I wanted to add a new dimension to the points that you have touched. And we've mostly addressed regulation with a view of basically um, uh, decreasing fast enough emissions now and uh, creating the feasibility conditions to reach net zero on the longer term. Um, but regulation also matters in terms of the legal framework associated with adaptation. And it's really difficult, in fact, to have in law the possibility to in, uh, inform today's decisions through plausible futures. So having a reference framework for adaptation as being currently developed for France, I think is really important so that we avoid further crises associated, for instance, with um, water scarcity or further crises due to the growing um, biogeophysical constraints in a warmer world, in particular biomass availability. I want to put a, an emphasis on that because there's also this use of biomass for energy, methane, biomethane production, but also biomass for heating, biomass as a feedstock to replace the use of fossil fuels in different contexts. And we need to be really very careful about um, uh, current trends and having probably stronger regulatory frameworks is important. 
In France, we've lost by half the carbon sinks from forests. Finland is struggling at the European level due to too intensive use of forests for Finland. And in France, just due to increased mortality, slower growth of trees because of a changing climate. So including these dimensions, a reference framework, uh, uh, scenarios of, on different time horizons, implications that will also um, be faced by the energy sector, um, I think is another dimension of regulation that's only starting. So much insight from our panel uh, today. Did you want to add something? No. Uh, Margot, another question perhaps? I think we've probably got time for two more questions. What do you think, Christine? Two more questions before we, we wrap up. Do you have another for us? Yeah, go ahead. So as students, we often ask ourselves the question of how uh, to manage a responsible career. So we may also wonder whether it's more effective to pursue a career as a scientist or as a politician drawing up regulations on the subject, or even to sit on company boards. So what advice would you give to your students with these questions who want to go into the energy sector? Super question there for our panel. What do you think? Do you want to go ahead, Estelle? Yeah, I guess sit on a company board is nice, but working for a company to actually build everything we've talked about, uh, I would say, uh, would be a very nice start in my opinion. So I guess, uh, we need all of that, uh, probably, uh, and we need science as well. So I'm a great believer of it's, uh, it's great. We, science won't solve everything, but without science, there is no way we, we can do any of everything we've talked about. So, uh, and then, you know, all the career you mentioned, you know, can have a role to play. I would just emphasize on the working in a company uh, can be can be one scenario which is uh, which have a very big impact. Just to give you an idea, in Veolia we measure the 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 success, including in the in the incentive scheme every year of all our managers, uh, with a few indicators. Half of them are financial. Uh, actually, four of them out of uh, 18 are financials. The other 14 are non-financials. And of course, we have a CO2 uh, embedded into that. So in a way, we measure, are we being successful? If we help our customer decarbonize, uh, this is a very important indicator to, uh, to be. So uh, uh, if you want perfection, don't join a company. If you want to be participating into, uh, into actually uh, helping the trajectories to go down and, uh, and actually uh, greening the universe, uh, maybe you should consider. Okay, anybody else on that question? Go ahead, yeah, I, I would say uh, scientists do not implement. So uh, uh, if you want to act, uh, it's, well, as citizen, I can act, of course. Uh, but it's not our role to implement. I mean, we are, we're here to no. inform, to support uh, decision-making and implementation. And in finance, uh, industries, uh, administration, are here also to implement administration with regulation, companies by deploying solutions and so on and so forth. So I would say we, we are, every, all these people are on one earth, as we say uh, our uh, uh, Republic president. So uh, uh, we have a role to play. So you just have to choose the one you want to play. Yeah, one word about science, um, and especially the experience of a PhD thesis. It's unique, three years to, deep, to go deep into a topic, to understand the state of the art in a subject, to learn the rule of science, you know, peer review, the rigor, the methodology. I think this is extremely powerful as a training, whatever you want to do later on. It's hard, <laughs> you're struggling against yourself, but the relationship you have with evidence is different. And if you choose to have that experience, then you can also change your path and work in the private sector or work in, in the policy sector. And actually, I personally think we need more young people trained in science to go into uh, uh, advisory boards, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, advisors of, of ministers and uh, public administration, high-level decision-making. Excellent point, absolutely. More people, yes, filtered in at that trajectory. Uh, yes, Laurence, a final word from you on this question. Yeah, I, I think... Uh you can go everywhere to have a successful career and, and defend your ideals. Uh, in any place is good. 
I think what is important vis-a-vis, -vis in particular, the economic and the business sector, is very and, and in a way, at the end of your university curriculum, as, as you have, many of you have said at the end last year, uh, when they were receiving their diploma, that they don't want to follow the business as usual, but they want a change. And this demand for change, and, and certainly Estelle knows that, it's a very strong push for companies to accelerate the change, because then you have your employees just asking for change and being active. And I think <clears throat> when I look at many companies now, they are, if they don't present opportunities for that change in terms of the real job they are doing, they are, they are losing candidates. And so you have a power there, very strong one, which is your talent, your training, and I totally agree with Valérie, this element of the thesis, and is now welcome in French companies, which is great. Uh, but then you have a power which is, we don't want to work for anything, we want to work for the change. And I think that a message that I think responsible uh, CEOs are now listening very carefully, I'm sure. They're acting, not only yeah. listening. 92% of all employees in Veolia, uh, and I'm including even operatives, you know, say they understand that they contribute to ecological transformation and would recommend uh, their families or, or relatives to work in the company. So again, it's not perfection, but uh, hopefully we're not only listening, we're trying to act. Well, there you have it, Alicia and Margot. The power is in your hands. Were you aware? Did you know that? You, you do now. Maybe we'll just take a final, final question from Alicia um, before we wrap up our first round table of the day. Okay. Okay, so I think I'm going to go with a question related to science and its impact on political decision maker coming from the academic world. That's a question that is really something for me. As you may know, to assess economic and financial impacts of climate change, academics often use complex models like integrated assessment models, system modeling, very complex model that even the scientists themselves debate in between them. And this model often includes many sources of uncertainty, such as electricity demand, future weather, carbon price, and often, as a solution, they propose different scenarios as a, real, as a result. But we've seen in the past year with COVID crisis, Ukraine crisis, that sometimes we might have unforeseen events that were not predicted by those scenarios. And do you think that political decision makers use this uncertainty to wait instead of acting? And what happens if they believe in the wrong scenario? What's the worst that can happen, according to you? Valerie, I see you nodding there. Why don't you, you set us off on that? So last month, IPCC ran a workshop on scenarios to take stock of what was uh, taken into account from the available literature to inform the assessments and, and thinking of the lessons learned and how it could be advanced in the future. And there were representatives of governments who also explained how they develop and use scenarios to inform their own decision making. And there are companies who develop their own scenarios, right? to inform decision-making and mid- and, and, and longer-term strategies. Um, I would like to, to not just address the uncertainties you mentioned, but another dimension. Um, the most uh, touchy issue and the most challenging issue in the scenarios used for global climate projections or um, emission mitigation pathways, I think the most difficult topic is equity. And most of the scenarios at the global scale have been developed by few groups of scientists worldwide with um, a too limited representation of scientists from countries in the global south that have different perspectives on equity, development, sustainability. And so I think one advance that will come in the coming years uh, will be a, a better accounting for issues associated with equity. Then there were, of course, also discussions related to how, to, um, how these idealized and scenarios based on a number of explicit assumptions can be reconciled with reality, can be reconciled also with the quick responses to specific shocks or crises, pandemic or Ukraine war. And to that, I don't have a, an, an answer myself. I would like to build on that because uh, since, in particular, the moment in 1997 where we craft the Kyoto Protocol, 
the economic modeling was very dominating on the solution, in particular because there was the idea that if we could find a global carbon price, the problem will be solved because it was particularly treated as one externality, not across the board. Now, of course, things are more complicated, but still, you see that the, one of the last uh, Nobel Prize in economics has been given to Nordhaus, which is a famous economist. We have seen Nordhaus from 30 years now, uh, defending the uh, model of optimization to know what will be the right economic optimum and the global temperature. His assessment, even it was three years ago, and it's even in the recent papers, is that an, optim an economic optimum will be a, a, an increase in temperature between 3.5 degrees to 4 degrees. So, like something is not working there. <laughs> and uh, the other colleagues who should have had the Nobel together with him, Martin Weissman, uh, said, because of the uncertainty you were referring to, you can have major catastrophes we cannot, which are, you know, you cannot go back, you cannot optimize, it's a risk management. And this is for the moment, I think it's very difficult, for, at least for the economic literature, which I know better, um, that just to, to put that in the normal, in a way, working methods. And uh, it is a very big area of innovation, and I know that the group three is really working hard for all these reasons that Valérie mentioned as well. But there is, a, a, of course, a, a problem in the structure of the theoretical model that prevent to look at the reality, and you have many, and uncertainties are part of this, but as well, the idea that you cannot optimize climate. That's not true. And because of the, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the rate of wealth, what we call the actualization rates, uh, so I think it's really a flow, and this flow, I, I insist on that, because this flow has prevented us to go farther and faster enough in the global negotiation, because there was always a good thing to say, we will do it later, because it will be less costly. And that is, that has cost, that is costing today the impact we are seeing. So it's a, models have a big influence, and they should be really uh, assessed correctly. Uh, so to come back on that, there's a huge need for tools to inform economic decisions to better account for um, the impacts of multiple climate hazards, not just you know, a linear relationship between uh, growth and uh, temperature, which is ridiculous, but accounting for extreme events, impacts on food insecurity, malnutrition, implications for you know, just skills, uh, limits of a changing climate for physical activity outside in some regions of the world, and hard limits, water, biomass availability in a warming world. It's not there yet. We need economical tools to better account for the costs of adaptation. Just think of coastal areas, one billion people, many large cities. Cost of relocation, just think of that. It's not yet included. So this is needed, but yet with the tools that are available now, and not just Nordhaus, more complex tools, the last uh, 2020, 2022 mitigation report from IPCC concluded that it's um, um, economically worth, in terms of cost benefits, to limit warming well below 2 degrees. 1.5 is more challenging because of the pace of uh, uh, emission uh, reductions on the very near term and implications associated with, for instance, extreme poverty. Okay, I think uh, we might uh, wrap that up there. I'd like to say thank you to Margot and Alicia for coming up and sharing those questions. We really appreciate it. And of course, what does that mean? The good news is that our QR code is working perfectly. We love it. That means for the other roundtables coming up, you'll be able to get your questions to us. Just before I let you go, little little game, I'd just like you to give us just one phrase on an overriding message that you absolutely want us to take away today. So you might say uh, most of the solution is in science, for example, but we've had so many good sound bites coming from you. What, what's the last message that you want to leave us with as we end this roundtable? If I start with you, Estelle, and only one phrase. Uh, the game is you're only allowed one phrase. Speed up with all existing solutions. Speed up, okay. Speed up and include everybody. Speed Population, up, regla uh, regulation, as well as companies. Okay, speed up, include everybody as well as companies. Laurence, the same challenge to you. No fatalism, no optimism, just action. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah, yes. Philippe. Uh, 
Trust and training. Trust in the training. Trust and training. Trust training. and training. Okay, well, we've got these really compact. Lovely. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Valerie. Think differently, and in addition to what can be done now, prepare the major changes needed towards net zero CO2, and for that, integrity matters. There's a UN high-level experts uh, report from last November for non-state actors like cities, like companies, with very simple integrity principles for net zero CO2 strategies, and they should be implemented. They should be implemented. It's been an absolute pleasure. Estelle, Laurence, Philippe, and Valérie, thank you so much for our first round table. Thank you so much. <laughs>